Great. Okay, so I think we talked a lot about uh, strategy, technology, digital, AI, and my deep learning. I think it's time to learn a few concepts on uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, so I'll just start the session by quoting uh, Clive James, is uh, an Australian author, poet, critic. It says that it's only when they go wrong that machines remind you how powerful they are. Uh, this is what happens when uh, when a cybersecurity event actually happens. So if you have a vulnerability or if you get attacked, the machines just remind you how powerful they are, how they can actually cripple your operations. So with this context also, we will uh, uh, there are some interesting statistics, right? Uh, every 40 seconds, you know, there is a, there is at least some organization in the world which is getting attacked. The cost of a cybersecurity event, or the cost or the damage that is actually done by cybersecurity events, uh, is close to eight billion dollars last year. Uh, at least four out of five physicians in the U.S. have been have experienced some kind of a you know of, of cybersecurity attack. Uh, the cost of a health record breach is is around four hundred and eight dollars, and that is up from three eighty dollars in the last. So with all this in mind and with all this digital and all that stuff that is actually happening, it is very important to ensure that we have the right level of security in place so that we are able to run the operations. So we are at the core of the entire operation, right? So when the hospitals are actually at the front line and they basically take the first hit, you know, when it comes to uh, when it comes to anything. And we are actually surrounded by an ecosystem of uh, you know, uh, partners or things that are actually there. We have the insurance companies, we have devices, we have customers, we have governments, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, partners, we have doctors. There are multiple stakeholders in place who, uh, who interact you know, uh, crisscross. So the providers at the core and trying to, you know, trying to manage all this in a much effective way. So in a digital world, the word digital uh, brings in a lot of chaos also, which means that uh, anything that, that is actually happening from a provider standpoint, there are a number of digital touch points that are actually there, and these digital touch points uh, in turn create a number of other challenges. Apart from this, the provider has experiences, economic, regulatory pressure, uh, compliance, geopolitical pressure, socio-economic pressures. And within all this, the provider is expected to be profitable. We should uh, increase revenues, improve EBITDA, and do all that stuff. So, what is the impact on digital and healthcare providers? With all this digital that is actually coming to play, uh, from a technology standpoint, there is increased reliance because you introduce new systems. Uh, because of this, uh, because we, we have done digitalization and digitization, uh, there is an expanded access to information. Now, everything is actually there in the system. Uh, from start to finish. Uh, now that everything is you know, technology based, there is a there is an increased need from your business for enterprise agility. You know, can you turn up a service in the next couple of hours? Can you pay, publish a quick survey uh, in the next uh, five minutes? That is the demand from the business. From a patient uh, standpoint, the demand of high quality care at low prices, uh, the demand for uh, curated experience right from a beat an OP or an IP or even after they go from a uh, after experiencing a chronic event, you know, they look for those curated experiences. From a provider standpoint, what we are what we should always give is because we are all the custodians of data, so there is a demand for higher accountability. There is a demand for higher transparency. And with all these digital in place, uh, patients want to see patients or I would say internal customers as well as external customers want to see uh, you know, dashboard, so data becomes very important, how we actually present all this. So with all this change in mind, you know, uh, there is a lot of things going on, and with the increased penetration of technology, systems become more vulnerable. So, the cyber, so in the last year, or in the last, you know, after the smack, the social mobility analytics cloud and all that actually came in early 2010, 2011, Cyber security incidents have actually been on the rise and majority of the breach is, you know, I would like to point out has been associated with internal actors. These actors are within the organization. I've pointed out a couple of surveys that have actually told that. 
and denial of service attacks are infrequent, but availability issues arise in the form of ransomware. We have seen WannaCry, we have seen Petya attacks, we have seen uh, Blue Keep, we have, we have seen Eternal Blue, uh, we have seen uh, cities being brought down in, in the US. Baltimore was the recent uh, you know, city which basically got attacked by a ransomware. They have spent close to $18 million trying to recover the systems. One of the key things that, that, we, that we need to point out is, uh, sorry that I don't have a point here, but if you see the threat actors, or I would say, if you see there have been 466 events, and in these 466 events, out of these 304 are confirmed data disclosures, majority, top three patterns are privileged misuse. It's very, because when we talk about the hospital information systems and the allied systems, be it a lab system or a claim management or a fax, there are a number of roles, responsibilities that we are, or role privileges basically assigned to different stakeholders right from registration all the way to IPOP and all this stuff. Now, the, the major event that, you know, or the major breach or, uh, you know, uh, is basically from a privileged misuse, okay? And even in this, if you see the threat actors, see the interesting statistics on threat actors being 59% of, uh, of the people that are, that, you know, that, you know, who's actually caused this, you know, a cyber security event are predominantly internal actors. These are the employees of the provider. Apart from this, external uh, is around 42 percent, and then partners and other multiple partners uh, parties basically constitute 3 percent. Majority of the motives is basically financial. Okay, so if there is an attack, if there is a demand in terms of Bitcoin, uh, there is a demand in saying thing that we release your data, they encrypt your entire data. And this has happened time and again in the last two, three years. It has been ransomware has been uh, has only grown, in, you know, in a rampant fashion. I, I don't know if you know this. Uh, there is something called a ransomware as a service. Let's say, like we had denial of service. There is a uh, the FBI basically caught these people uh, who have basically had this DDoS as a service. So as far as you can pay two ninety nine dollars, two point nine nine. I'm not saying two hundred ninety nine. Two dollars ninety nine cents or five dollars ninety nine cents. You can create various forms of havoc, you know, to any corporation by the terms of DDoS attacks and things. There are people who give ransomware as a service which can which can do similar things that are actually done. So if you see the compromise of data, uh, majority has been medical data, so it's personal identifiable information, sensitive personal information, or personal health records that are actually there, right? Uh, credentials constitute 24%, but if you see the medical is 72% and personal data is around 34%. And this is validated by this survey from uh, the HIMSS cybersecurity. The previous one part was from the Verizon data breach report where they had around, last year alone, there were around 41,000 incidents out of which 2,103 were confirmed breaches, okay? In India, we don't have that much of statistics that is actually there, but these are all the confirmed breaches in healthcare, okay? Now, important, figures. When we talk about bad, bad actors, the most common form of entry, uh, you know, is email. So phishing attacks basically had, you know, the bad actors predominantly came through phishing attacks. Uh, how many of you have heard about this? Uh, you know, you've, you've seen these in your spam boxes, the Nigerian prince uh, email, right? So somebody writes an email saying that I have 14 million dollars in the bank and I want to give it to you. And if the ones you start responding, uh, you know, their Satsi story. So, online scam artists like, you know, um, phishing, spear phishing. Spear phishing is basically, uh, you know, what do you say? If they know who the person is and they basically go all out to, uh, you know, to, uh, def you know, fraud them. Uh, how many of you have heard about this new term called as fish trapping? Uh, fish trapping is basically a, a very terrible incident that has actually happened several years before. Uh, you know, and this is predominantly used by terrorists, uh, uh, you know, where they repackage the old news and they basically let it out on social media and again create havoc. That's called a fish trapping. Uh, that's a new form of, uh, you know, uh, cyber attack. Uh, so what they basically use and they have, uh, you know, they, there are certain groups in social media who basically even, you know, reshare these news and make it viral and, uh, you know, it basically creates a scam on people, right? Um, Malicious insiders and uh, negligent insiders. So, 31, I would say 20 percent is actually on the rise. Negligent insiders. How many of you have experienced? How many of us have actually experienced, uh, you know, 
uh, building frauds, claim management frauds, uh, you know, frauds in, in the pharmacy. So majority of them, and there are people who still share credentials. So a building manager who has to give an approval, um, after six o'clock he's not there in office, what is, you know, what is say, if, if some approval has to come at around eight o'clock or nine o'clock, they basically share their password, the billing executive logs out of his credential and starts approval. So they can give any amount of, uh, you know, discretionary discount and uh, ensure things are taken care of, right? So majority of the events are basically from inside. So there is a, there is a serious need to educate people about these threats. There is a serious need to monitor all these people. It, it, is, it, it also, uh, you know, brings in, uh, you know, we have to bring in those systems to ensure that privilege is not received. So I talk about some of the recommended practices that are actually there. So these are some of the three key points that, uh, you know, that the survey points out. Okay, uh, this is a very well known thing. Uh, we have seen, uh, this is the cycle of emergency management. The key point over here is, we need to have, we need to be systematic, we need to have a consistent approach, we need to have a structured approach, we need to have a proper cyber security strategy in place. We need to see what sort of, you know, are we going to say, are we going to adopt defensive mechanisms or offensive mechanisms? What is our posture? You know, it's very important to determine that. And frameworks from National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, they have a cyber security framework which every one of you should uh, you know, go through it out of these five phases, uh, identify, protect, detect, respond, you know, uh, recover. These five phases that are actually there and it helps you to understand what your asset status and what your to be state need to be, right? And how many of the times, you know, when you had WannaCry attacks, Petya attacks, uh, you know, the Blue Keep, uh, you know, attacks that have actually happened, majority of the times we are the impact is basically, you know, we do, we don't do prevent and mitigate or we don't prepare. Majority of the time we are doing firefighting. That from you know as a country, as a provider, as, as, as providers, we need to change our approach. We need to put uh, you know uh, uh, we need to put the right set of controls and make the right set of investments to ensure that we prevent and mitigate these incidents and we prepare for those. It doesn't mean that we you know, there is one observation of how much technology or how much we should do. Cyber security thing, initiatives are, you know, you can invest any amount of money. But then, if you want to realize the benefit of it, first thing is you do is you basically map any initiative, any cyber security initiative, you need to map it to business outcomes. So if you map it to business outcomes and make the right kind of investments, you would be able to prevent and mitigate incidents, you'll be able to prepare for risk catastrophic events that can actually happen and you'll be able to effectively even respond and recover even there is major incidents. Okay, so um, I like pictures, I like visualizing that. I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, there is no ref, you know, these are all very generic ones because this is something I prepared without the product names. So we have this, uh, you know, thing in NH called as uh, TRM, uh, SRM, DRM, which we call as technology reference map, uh, security reference map, and the data reference map. It is very important to understand across all these layers what sort of applications are actually running. What is my, what are the security applications that are actually running? What are my business applications that are actually running? What are the different modules that are actually there? How these systems talk to each other, whether they pass credentials, whether they pass API information, whether they pass MRN number, it is very important to map out all this. If you have not done that, it is better to uh, do that. And you know, I would be able to uh, lend my assistance uh, you know, to help you building that. So these layers, okay, starting from the bottommost layer, uh, you know, the infrastructure layer, there are a number of techniques and uh, you know solutions that are actually available you know to uh, you know which you can employ in each of these layers and ensure that you know the right amount of security so it helps you to you know prepare better it helps you to uh, mitigate uh, issues it helps you to respond better it helps you to recover also so across an infrastructure layer across application security across end user security and how do you need to run operations uh, you know, from a standards perspective, what documentation that you need to have. If you have, you know, uh, if you have, if you have, you may not need all elements of this. You know, we are a large organization, so we require, and there are multiple systems running. Based on the size of your organization, whether it's a small, medium, or a large enterprise, 
you know, ask your IT or uh, the information security team to come out with a reference map of what do we have today across all these layers. It helps you to understand where the missing element is of right? So, this is a good way of, uh, you know, understanding what your current landscape is and see how to, you know, uh, progress, uh, you know, in the cyber security journey. And this is not what we built in, in six months time or three months time. It took three years. It took a good amount of investment, uh, uh, you know, to do something like this. Uh, I wouldn't say which is present, which is not present. Again, uh, but this is a reference map which you can actually, it's a reusable asset. They, you know, we are also talking, you know, we are also, with Chime, we are actually uh, working uh, to see how we can actually uh, open source some of these uh, uh, collaterals or templates for the larger good so that other healthcare providers can actually adopt. Okay, some of the re recommended practices, this is purely, and again, I am not saying whether I have done this, I have not, I've, I've not done this, but this is something. Uh, which is, uh, which is really essential. So when we talk of identity management, so we saw about negligent actors, we talk about privilege misuse. Uh, so the first thing is uh, use single sign-on. Uh, so one ID, one password regime, uh, that, is, that, is, that is very essential. You have a single source of identity or a single source of truth, which is your HRMS. Uh, ensure that there is end-to-end -end automation you know, right from the birth of an identity to the death of an identity, right? It is very important to do that. So, identity provisioning and deprovisioning, role privilege assignment, segregation of, you know, so we did this exercise in NH. Uh, we had around 3,100 roles in, uh, you know, in our hospital information. So, 3,000 is humongous. Everybody, you know, it was, uh, it was, we just created it. So, after I came in, we, uh, we analyzed all that and uh, we consolidated all those roles. From 3,100, we reduced to 310 roles. Uh, we not only did that, we were able to clearly do segregation of duties, identify what the conflicting roles are, hand it over to the business and basically said, this is your uh, responsibility, you need to take care of. Which means that segregation of duties, uh, for monthly user audits, quarterly role privilege audits are basically done and the business basically signs off. Okay, password vaulting, uh, personal as well as work, it is very important to use a password manager. How many of you use spreadsheets where you store your passwords? It's a bad practice. Okay, uh, there are a number of credential databases are basically sold outside the market, right? Don't, uh, you know, so at least some identity, some password have actually gone. One of the very senior uh, doctors basically had a spear phishing where uh, the password which he basically used two weeks before basically featured in the email. Right? It is it is a very scary situation. So always there are tools like Dashlane, uh, LastPass, they are free versions. Uh, please ensure that you use the password managers, uh, you know, for work as well as personal. Privilege identity management, uh, who is getting into your infrastructure, who is getting into your application, there is a privilege identity management solution that is available. Browser management, there is because when you use Chrome or Firefox, you are opening the web store over there. There are so many malwares that people actually publish on, on these web stores and the play stores or the app stores that are actually there. We got to be careful for that. We have some uh, very interesting solutions on that front. Multi-factor authentication, which means that an OTP, after you enter the password, uh, do you provide an OTP, right? So for all the critical accounts, for the chief executive officer or the chief operating officer, for those critical people, how do you basically secure their mail boxes? Biometric authentication for you know, critical transactions, have you thought about in billing, right? Uh, how many of you, State Bank of India basically did this, right? You go to the teller counter before dispensing, you know, a cash or doing a critical transaction, they do biometric authentication. Why can't we actually do that in healthcare, right? Those, so those are some of the things that we can do on identity management. Apart from that, uh, uh, we do these, uh, a simple way to phishing, uh, to stop phishing, right? Uh, how many of you have put a banner in your email saying that this mail has originated from an external domain, uh, please check the sender and then open the attachments. A very simple way to prevent phishing, right? So. Social engineering attacks can actually be prevented using you know, a small uh, changes like that. Uh, threat intelligence, again, there are a number of sources of information. There are interesting podcasts called the Cyberwire, Hacking Humans. 
uh, I, you know, CIOs and CISOs can actually go through that and you know get a world view of what is actually happening on that on the threat intelligence part. Monitoring, there are several ways to monitor your infrastructure and applications. Uh, uh, they, you know, it is it is very vital. These are the potential entry points for for any hacker. Uh, so, you know, it is it is essential that we put in the adequate controls uh, from a monitoring standpoint. Data protection, when you talk about data integrity or the confidentiality, integrity and availability, uh, the database is pretty important because that's where, that's what basically, all your medical records are basically held in the database. So adequate controls in the form of audit in terms of recovery testing. Uh, your DR drills, I don't know how many of us uh, you know, do DR drills regularly. So every three months or six months, uh, do proper DR, BCP, failover, failback, because that would actually give you the confidence to ensure that if a catastrophic event happens, you know, you, these solutions will basically take over and ensure that operations are seen uh, The last part is the review part. Have you defined key performance indicators to measure how the effectiveness of information security is there in your organization? Um, have you gone through a risk assessment from the NISC? It's, you can download it, you can do it by yourself. It's not, it's, it's not rocket science. It's pure English. You, can, you, just, you just have to sit and we do it sitting with our business stakeholders. Because the business has to understand uh, what you know what what we mean. Because there is we map it to business outcomes. So you have your reference maps, documentation, and always follow this outside in innovation approach. You know, invite other partners. Uh, you know, to bring in that uh, element of knowledge, and then you know by by showcasing their products or services, so that you get a better world view, and you know you be able to effectively provide you know or effectively defend your. Uh, organization against cybersecurity uh, audits. So apart from that, last but not least, just be a partner for your internal audit teams. Your inter don't look at internal audit teams as somebody who always find out a fault. But if you partner with them, it helps you in uh, you know preparing for the worst. The overall posture or overall security uh, you know uh, score will definitely improve because uh, and that's what we actually do in NS. We partner with them and ensure that the uh, the overall cybersecurity posture is not wrong. Okay, I would end my presentation. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you.